Yeah, now that I know how, now that I know how easy it is to uh, edit the sound part, it, mm -hmm. this is good. Okay, great. And that will also allow me to feel very confident that if I'm going too far or off topic that you're going to um, keep me in the loop of what you want. That's a goal. I, I mean, I thought we did a great job of it um, as in the first session, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, you know, and, and that's something I do naturally with my clients. It's, it's this, I've been using this model for um, eight, 20 years with clients. So um, I'm kind of tuned into that anyway. Um, and it keeps me on track because I can spiral out. I'm sure you. Well, you, you and I delight in doing so together. Um, I get that. And also, uh, as the conductor, I'm looking at you to, you know, take the wood wing, woodwind section and take the wind out of it if need be. Right? <laughs> I doubt we're going to have to do much of that. But uh, I yeah. Well, it just gives me comfort to know that I don't have to worry. Am I going on too much about this or whatever? He'll tell me. Please don't. Uh, yeah, boy, especially when you see the two hours we did with um, uh, with uh, Kimberly Doherty, who I I know you'll grow to love, and I would love to get the two of you together. I'd love that. Um, but she's on the other side in Seattle. But um, I, she did the Earth section with me, and um, and we went. I mean, the areas we places we went but that's what we do when we talk I mean, yeah that's what we do so <laughs> so are we ready yeah i okay. am welcome everyone to soul lab podcast series this is kelly nazat and i have john d whitis here with me and i hope you were able to see the the fire talk we did the podcast interview we did earlier Today, we get to go deeper. This is the deep dive. And whereas the first one was really kind of getting, you know, into uh, areas of proficiency and technical things in that, in that way, uh, and her profession, which is incredible, uh, this is a bit more of um, a share between um, your uh, us fellow practitioners and uh, talking between peers about the process of development and how she moved into her process, uh, what she's going through, and just getting a little bit deeper insight into um, where she's coming from, where she's going to, where she is now. And we're going to do it in a way that's, uh, you know, holding around the model of the spiral. Uh, it's the way I practice my work. I, I use it as a, a way to sort of holding like a template to interview my clients so that I know that I'm, uh, I assure myself at least that we're getting to elements that are important. So uh, thank you, Jandi, for joining us again. It's a great pleasure. I really enjoy these. Thanks. You're welcome. Well, in terms of fire stuff, and you know, fire is creativity, and we had, uh, you know, a, a trial by fire. The first one we did the interview, and it actually was uh, corrupted. I don't know some technical thing. I, uh, it seems to be a whole host of those. So that's part of the creative process, isn't it? Having to not just learn how to deal with other people, but also dealing with technical stuff. So we got exactly. it going. <laughs> we got it going. And you never know what happens in all that corruption. Always something very creative. Oh, I love it. Yeah, there's a lot of creativity and corruption. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's a whole nother topic. I was going to say, I'm not going there. <laughs> <laughs> this, that would definitely take uh, more than a few talks. Yeah. So, John D., mm -hmm. thank you for being willing to uh, do the deep dive because, as we talked before, this really is getting into something a bit more personal, a bit more uh, John D. in terms of your process. You know, we always try to put our best foot forward. We always attempt to be the most professional we can be and really to show up. Uh, I think in many ways, that's what we're here to do. But on another level, one of the things I see in students and clients as well is they don't see the other side. They don't see um, the, the sweat and tears and challenges and learning and, and development and all those things. And um, if they did, I think it would be of service. I absolutely agree with that. I mean, I, I think the word for what we're talking about is being authentic, right? Um, perhaps stretching that out is about being seen. 
right? And being seen is apparently a really scary thing for people. It's that be, being seen, publicly speaking, is the number one fear of Americans. Really? Uh, but that tells us that's what we're really up to is when we can model being seen with confidence, with love, with acceptance, uh, as a growth experience, we give them courage to do the same. Right. And so, I, I mean, moreover, I think that isolation is the number one killer of all practitioners. Um, and a lot of that is about not feeling able to show up as who I am, not being able to embody my own doubts and faltering steps at times um, for fear of judgment. And, and that's really what I was saying about the number one American fear is I'm going to be judged, right? And so that translates into this area seamlessly, I'm sorry to say, uh, but, but it makes perfect sense, right? So when we can show up as who we are and we can speak uh, we don't even have to be eloquent about it, but when we can speak honestly and with ease of that which is difficult for us or what we have been through without an eye to upsell or cause a, you know, an allegory is going to happen here. No, just as is. We give people that courage and confidence to follow suit. And I think that is one of the biggest things that we offer our students and followers and those that we would uh, teach what we know and pass on to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the teaching I had early on was um, it's really just you and another person or it's you, there is this field that we come together in, and mm -hmm. dropping into the heart and really coming from this place of heart centeredness. I remember we talked about that before, and I remember the moment uh, uh, Luada told me this when I was young, and I was I was nineteen, I think, or twenty, and I really felt awkward. Mm -hmm. I I didn't realize how much I had created this or developed this persona okay. in order to present in a certain way that not to show myself off by any means, because I definitely have much more of an introverted side, but more to be able to present as a way to to satisfy the masses or to to make another. It's kind of like a social handshake. I was going to say in order to be acceptable. Yeah. Right? And I think that's sort of in astrology, the Gemini dilemma. The mm. Gemini is like the two sticks. It's like a, a, the great thing about a Gemini, and they're at the top of the, the, the air realm and high-level codified communication, uh, they really are the communicators, but the dilemma for them is that they become so, their mirror neur neurons or empathy uh, you know, genes are so tuned in that they lose themselves in the contract. Yes, I think that's really well said. The empathy, uh, the empathy genes that we all have are sort of working too well. Too well. Right. And so we get lost in that because I think we don't have at, at 19. I'm just going to speak for myself. I did not have the presence of mind or character or whatever you want to call that to discern what is me and what is my desire to be acceptable. Um, I did not have that. But I do. <laughs> I do remember trying hard to work it all out. And my mentor at the time went, who told you that you would be able to? I just want to know. <laughs> High expectations. Yeah, I guess so. Um, but yeah, that developed persona is something that is useful, but just like empathy, to a point at which point it folds back in on itself and becomes degenerative. Which in itself is a, a progressive process because the, there, and that's a hard part when it starts to fall apart. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because mo mostly we panic at that point, <laughs> yeah. right? And panic is not good for uh, thinking. Much, <laughs> not right. good for much. Well, that that we were talking earlier about Carol Dweck's work at Stanford and the fixed versus uh, the the uh, growth mindset, mm -hmm. and and I I can remember very well the fixed mindset for myself, mm -hmm. and thinking, oh my God, I've got you know this ability. I I know this amount. I remember being in, young in school and thinking, I, I don't know what they're doing. I I don't get it. So I'm not going to get it. Whereas the growth mindset would say, oh, my God, this is a great challenge. Well, not to throw my forebears under the bus, but, you know, I, w I was raised very fundamentally and somehow 
just came in knowing that that wasn't right uh, for me, yeah. right? I, knowing that there is more than this is, to me, this idea we're talking about. It is the open rather than the fixed. And when we're surrounded by people who have fixed, we uh, we automatically have, behave in some very common ways, right? One, we're going to fight it, and we're going to be right, and we're going to convince them, and right? We're going to open up that mind. <laughs> and the other is maybe you shake the dust off your sandals and you just travel to another town. You know, uh, that spectrum, I think, pretty much describes it. And and it takes a, a maturing and a practice and a thoughtfulness to say, you know what, resting in the middle of that's just the way it is for them right now and then not attaching it to ourselves doesn't mean anything particularly about us unless we make it that way. And I think that's a really helpful thing to turn uh, people on to is, is what if it were not a case of either of those kinds of actions, but simply just being in that space of acceptance, I guess. Lovely place to be, right? I mean, that's that 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 admonition to just be in a, a place of heart centeredness of love, mm -hmm. which brings compassion, awareness, attunement. And if you can't get there, I think it's really okay. <laughs> it's more than okay. I think it's necessary to say, what other place can I be in right now than this place? If I feel myself drifting either way. You know, when you when you can consciously catch that and just ask simply and and childlikeness, well, what other place could I be in besides that place? I think that alone is going to help you sit in the middle of that spectrum happily. And um, I've mentioned to you, I think, before, the, the idea of the bob and the wave mm -hmm. is uh, a beautiful place. And even if you get taken over by the wave, you have that moment, if you can see it, you have that moment where you go, oh, I'm just, I, I'm being sort of oscillated. But I don't know if that's good or bad. It's just this place of oscillation. Right? And what does that say about opening up to to be influenced and to be able to tune into that, that bigger flow that's beyond, we're, we're so inner and inward focused and especially as we're talking about the initial phase of fire is all about ego development, recognizing that inner fire, there's something unique coming through you, yet the middle fire is bringing that out into the world and actually uh, the hero in their home on the couch or in the bedroom is a is a is my hero in in the house of my own inner space is infinite man has he is he accomplished but it's when i bring him out when or he brings me out to the world and says well this looks good let's try it out yeah I'm kind of icarus like and there's you know some burning away going on i think that's a whole concepts of alchemy talking about the psycho spiritual calcinatio the burning away you say there is this fire inside, but there is something that that fire knows about you, that you're an impure vessel, but that's okay. You have desires, mm -hmm. you have ego, but that'll all burn away. And and I do, I guess it gets gets back to the, the C word all the time. You know, I think that's a conscious choice place. It doesn't mean that I consciously know all. It just means I've, I've consciously put myself in the place of asking or of questioning or being or just maybe it's that primal question of, is it okay just right this moment? Is it okay just right now? The question. Yeah. And I, I think I have to consciously ask it, though, because otherwise I get carried away by my own neurobiology, you know? You mean carried off by thoughts, carried off by fear? Panic. Emotions. Right. Somatic expressions, all the elements. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And succumbing to my biology is, is probably not what I want to do. I embrace it, but I don't know about succumbing to it. And, and so I just, uh, I, I guess I'm constantly reminded of, and that's a lot of work I do with people who have, let's call it repetitive anxiety kinds of habit, is, is what I call uh, creating a new normal for yourself. 
right? That encompasses the idea of let's just stop and ask the question. That's not a habit they came in with or they have at present. I don't know which it's different for everybody. But in helping teach them how to do that, we help them in the way that we just said, not be succumbing to their biology or their, their, their habit that they formed, but consciously creating a new habit that serves them better. Yeah. Well, I saw in the, recently in the Harvard Review that they were talking about uh, signs of, uh, of uh, high-minded leaders and, and those that are successful. And one of the keys was, uh, do they ask questions? Mm. And that speaks to your open mind concept, uh, Carol's concept, right? Yeah. Open, ask questions. Open is always looking and taking notes. Receptive. Receptive is a great word. Mm, I like that. Yes. Um, but it, it has to be. I can't imagine how that report that you're speaking of would be able to do that if it was closed. Leadership, um, which is a whole other three-hour conversation, right? But leadership is uh, much like that conductor of the orchestra. It's taking all those disparate elements and seeing how can we join commonly in a goal, a movement, a path. And you have... I think leadership recognizes that, and I am going to find that that unites us. And in order to do that, well, I have to recognize that you're not thinking the same thing as him or him or her or, or me. And yet. How do you hold that? I, I mean, how do you see, if we're looking at that in that way, as a mm -hmm. person, as a personhood, as a leader, how do you see that being held to be able to know your place in that uh, process, know how they're seeing you, know how they'll respond and all that. How do you dance that? Well, you know, I, I'm going to be probably just egocentric here, but um, being a child who moved all my life meant mm. every situation is new and different, and you're going to learn from it, and you're going to take that with you in your suitcase when you go to the next place. Right, so it's very acquisitive sort of knowledge and repeating that it, it led me to this place. Also, uh, I'm blessed to do for a living training and mentoring of people. And so I always go into it with the expectation that I'm delighted I'm going to get to share something and I wonder who's there and what I'm going to learn from them. Because every moment I think is like that. And uh, you know, speaking to that leadership angle that you were talking about before, I learned at a very young age, probably strangely young, um, probably about the time I was 19, I used to do focus group moderation. <laughs> Maybe they were desperate, I don't know. But um, the, the deal was I learned very quickly how the entire room could turn on one person's energy concept, the look on their face, and it hilariously and badly I learned but I learned very quickly that you are always open to who in the room is not on the same frequency where is it going to come from because I would like to be prepared in order to meet that and so you know I guess in that moment I, I started growing longer antenna um, but I, I I use this hilarious thing even so. I, I remember being in a, a college university um, continuing professional education class full of social workers, and somebody just came at me. And, and I, I have no idea apropos of what. I think it just finally bubbled up inside them, and they had to... And everybody in the room swiveled and locked heads and went, just, you know, what is going to happen? It was a very scary, palpably scary time for these professionals because this thing unanticipatedly had just crawled out. And in that moment, thank you. Thank you, universe. I had the presence of mind as well as the practice from a child who moved all their life to go, hmm, that's interesting. I didn't say that. That's what was going on. And I was able to take a breath, take a pause, just be in that present moment and move slowly towards that person 
in what I assumed was some kind of uh, positive way <laughs> and reassuring way. And I said, I'm so grateful you told me because that's not what I intended at all. Please let me try again to say the message in a way that is more accessible. Wow. And the whole room, pff, like a souffle. And I was like, ah, thank you. But that response <laughs> was at once, you know, it's empathy. Yes, that person's obviously feeling something. But it was practiced, conscious approach of an open-mindedness that caused this thing, perhaps, that we call leadership to be able to rise to the occasion. So that was a long-winded story, perhaps, but I think it no, illustrates all those principles uh, and where it might come from for you. And so as we're teaching new leaders, you are and I am for sure in our jobs and our avocations, hmm. um, we're looking to em empower them with this uh, self-knowledge, self-awareness, as well as this completely open awareness of the others that that will be surrounding them. We're not sending them out with the expectation that everything's going to be great and everybody's going to think you're bees knees and it, you know, no one will ever challenge you on that. We're, we're not making that kind of person. Why would we? It, it's disingenuous at best. Um, so, you know, may, maybe this is, is uh, just reinforcing what doesn't need reinforcing, but I believe that's part of how we teach others to help heal in the world is creating that. Yeah. You know, as, as you're saying this, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm of course referring to uh, my way of navigating through, through the, the complexity of this processing of being and becoming the alchemy of, of, of self-actualization, if you will, and being what you're here to be. And that's why this mapping helps me because it's easy for me to go into the complexities. I love that. Uh, the challenge is distilling it down into its essence so that it's functional, it's usable, and it's on point for how I'm to be in service. And so when we look at this first phase of FIRE, you, 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 it's analogous to the hero's uh, journey with uh, Joseph Campbell. And the first phase is the hero awakens to this big journey and say, oh my God, this is exciting. I am so on fire with this. And the second thing is the refusal of the call. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's the third, I think it's the second. But almost immediately, uh, you know, moving into fire two, you bring it, you want to bring it out there. Uh, I wanted to bring uh, uh, this wisdom I found from the alchemy and the shamanic work that I had practiced into a clinical field. And mm -hmm. I quickly found that there was uh, no true place for it uh, within the practice. And there was a lot of scrambling going back and forth. And much of the burning, the, the smell of burning flesh was my own. Mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't for nothing. It was, uh, it was once you take that task on, it is, uh, um, it's a, it's a self undoing. And that's a good thing. That's part of individuation process. But in, encouraging others to go through that fire. Mm -hmm. Say, no, take that out there. Follow your bliss. There's something deep inside of you that needs to come through. Each of us, I believe firmly that we each, each of us has a directive that's unique, that's important to bring out into the world. And maybe we do it again and again and again. And sometimes maybe we succeed, sometimes we don't. But we have this opportunity. We are living processes and these reiterative patterns, right? And so... When I'm looking, when I'm working with clients or working with students, the one thing I'm looking for is what's holding them back from living into that authentic self. I mean, we use that term a lot, but it's a very important term. What, who are you? What are you about? And how are you living that truth in a, in a good way? In a way that, in a good way, that also means, is it in resonance within and without? Right. Well, I'm, I'm also seeing, as you're talking, I'm seeing that, that model with the quadrants. And I am, I am seeing in my mind's eye that you are actively looking, no matter what model, but I'm looking at your model right now, of saying, you know, you have so many gifts and strengths here. And this is 
where you are right now doing this stuff and I'm I'm helping them discover where they are right now in that process and with what gifts and also that's the place where I think we're asking them and knowing this about yourself and then looking at this kind of situation what can you bring to it now that you know this about yourself, right? And then the question becomes uh, turned over. It said, and what now do you see mm. in your background or what you have learned that actually holds you back? Yeah. Right? I think that is one of the most wonderful things that we can do for them is sit with them in the unknowing until each part becomes more clear and more in focus and is more useful to them. It, to see it all in context. To see oh, beautiful, yes, yes. Context. yes. There's, there's something, I think that's the alchemist's gift is, mm -hmm. is to see where the elements of process uh, all play a part. And they're all dancing in the quantum field together. None of it is separate. That's the illusion. We're yeah. always in the fire, just as we're always in the earth trying to sort it out and, and ground it and root it. Uh, there's, right. But that we can hold a space for where we are in a way that uh, kind of calms the chaos, keeps us from spiraling out. And as Jung said, always keep your eye on the center, the, the fifth element, the ether soul element. And if you can do that, that, that gaze alone will keep, that's enough centripetal pull back in to uh, to dance with the centrifugal pull that pulls us out into these elements, whether it's into our emotions or into our physical complaints or into our minds or you know our our, our aspirations, there's always and and I think that's why the the meditative practices are so important, whatever that might be, whatever helps you find that center, a mm -hmm. place of coherence that allows you to be in it. I completely feel that and believe that and i think one of the ways we help them do this center place is to say help them i don't know if it's actually verbiage or not but help them say and and what is bigger than that and a bigger picture of that is and a bigger perspective of that and a bigger point of view of that until you know we do have that bird's eye view which allows things to I want to say fall into their proper place so that I can see it because when it's in front of my nose, I'm no better than the average bear at, at understanding what that is or what to do about it. I'm, I'm in that same place that they are. Yeah. Right. And so maybe one of the things you're doing Kelly is you're triggering them in a good way to ask that question to say, what can I make of this and where do I find myself at this moment and where am I looking at this from and and what might be bigger than that you're helping them develop the practice of questioning and being in the place or seeking that place but in a real-time way you know not not in a Frodo way real-time right now right now it is important and in, in all the practices I've learned there is this the, the, what's central to most of them is breaking the fixation of a uh, fixated view. So <laughs> if you're in your head you, and, and that's your view, that's, that's a, like Carl Jung said, the only wrong interpretation of a dream is the one interpretation. <laughs> you know? So it is, it's saying, okay, well, yes, okay, let's take it from there. We have, we have uh, fixated views are very limited. It's myopic. Mm -hmm. um, so what are the options? And what I love about, I learned from the medicine wheel initially uh, that simplified. I had been reading Gnosticism and alchemy and Carl mm -hmm. Jung's work since I was, I don't I guess, 18 or 17. And I loved it I, because it spoke, um, it, it used language that was English that spoke to the worlds, the other worlds that I was experiencing that I couldn't share well. So he could articulate these things, but he brought the complexity out. But the, the medicine wheel brought the simplicity back. Mm. And the, the eagle flies off and where the sun rises, and, and they get this meta view, the, the top of the spiral, the air and fire. Uh, Icarus at the pin, uh, pinnacle of his uh, exaltation, right? Right. And, uh, and that's an important phase to be in, but it's to look at the things close up. So the East is big picture and in some of the traditions anyway. The South is um, the movement towards seeing what's right in front of you, uh, the snake, the mole. It's, um, it's close up. 
So we've gone, and I practice this as a daily routine. I, I first wake up and I get my meta perspective and I see the big picture as much mm-hmm. as I can. At three, four in the morning, I get up, I do my meditations, my writings, but then I go back to sleep around five or so, get back up, and then I'm, I'm the mole, I'm the, the snake. Everything is my computer right in front of me. And, and there is a place for that. There, the, you know, the reptile, its world is two feet and two, sec, uh, two minutes all around it, mm-hmm. right? And then it goes into the west where it goes in within, uh, water realm, the deep, and the earth realm, going deep inside. And they call it the bear's cave in, in some traditions. And that's because looking within is scary. And then it completes the rounding back in the north to the white buffalo or the white owl where it's of completion. And so there we see an entire psycho-spiritual process. And, and again, the mandalas, the medicine wheels, even that I notice even in uh, the Christian uh, model of the Trinity itself is a psycho-spiritual model, which mm-hmm. is a great discussion, but uh, obviously uh, it could get really deep into that. But but what I what I'm appreciating is we have always... Uh, those that have really wanted to be thoughtful in the world and wanted to bring some good into the world or wanted to create in the world. Let's just take that, take that goodness out of it, which is what we're hoping for. But to be creative and to be effective means that you, you do need to tune into where you're at in the process, both on a micro and a macro level. And the simpler you can make that process, the better. I, I couldn't have said that any better. I don't think. I mean, I'll just riff off it and say, yeah, I think that we have that capability for a reason. Yeah. I think we need those, both of those, in order to be informing ourselves, right? In order that we should creatively respond. Yeah. Right? So the question of what will you do with what you find? What will you do with what you find? Mm -hmm. You're a mentor. You you teach this work. Yes. What are some of the what are some of the what would you say are some of the the key challenges and and maybe even offer some uh, sense of a, a a resource or a tool you would use uh, for one of these challenges you might find with in a class or a client. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, the first thing that comes to me right now when you ask that. Is, is again about returning to that honesty, that grounded honesty. And if, if we are going to go there, I usually have to go first, show that it's okay. You have to model that, in other words. And part of that is I know that every one of you also feels like I have felt and will do so again. And it's called, what if I'm not good enough? What if I'm not worthy? What if I don't deserve? Right? So if we're being honest, all of us will ask that question at one point or another. And that's a really great place to start. You know, so th- the idea of flipping it over this scary bear's cave into, I wonder what might be out there if I pop my head out the door. And once I pop out the door, here we go back to your the, the question we just had a moment ago. What will I do with what I find? And then let's talk about the second scary paradigm that's going to happen, which is I don't know. And only from the place of I don't know can you learn. Mm. Right? If you do know, why are you here? It's a powerful realization. The ultimate realization. What is there to you? My my, uh, my immediate mentor in this particular iteration that, that I teach of uh, EP and EFT, she has come full circle to this place of deliciousness that I now share with you, which is, could we start in honesty? That's kind of me talking around her paradigm, but can we start in honesty? Would you join me? Here's where we're going to start even though I don't know. That is the only thing I actually do know. I don't yet know about this thing that I'm focused upon. Not yet. I completely 
accept the fact they don't know. Of course they don't know yet. But this is the first step of the journey ahead. If that's what, if I want to know, the first step is to say I do not. And as we go through the tapping algorithm, which the shortcut version is very simple points on the face and the upper torso, bada bing, really mm -hmm. fast. Um, the idea is not those points necessarily. The idea that I stimulate and enter my nervous system, my limbic system, and therefore my unconsciousness. Where everything is known that I can know from my own experience, and yet I'm not even aware that I know it. So here I am again in that I don't actually know yet. Hmm. And that is the honest place that we begin. Right? Does that sound reasonable to you? Hmm. Yes, it does. It's like tapping on that inner child and saying, look, it's okay. I'm with you. Yeah. It's like I bring my kids. I remember my son, Augustine, was, uh, I think he was three, three and a half. And he said, Dad, we're going to go into this party and I'm going to be very shy. But I want you to know that it won't last. It'll just be a little while. And then I'll, once I feel comfortable, I will start to be more present. And it was such a lucid accounting, you know. Oh, my gosh. I'm, I'm impressed with Augustine. Yeah, he's he's got that that um, and I you know I see it in sports and everything else. He he's still he's only six now, but he watches and he's and there is this receptivity as we talked about earlier, and then there's this watching the field, watching the movement, and then once he feels the rhythm, it's like watching the waves. Then he gets in and surfs it and dances with it, and it's something that you know I love the archetypal work for this reason. Mm -hmm. Because we recognize fully that we're more than this monomyth, in a sense that we're more than this sort of uh, singular self, that while there is a part of me that is the hero that wants to conquer um, the world and, and, and be a good do-gooder and, do, and, and make people come back into a loving place, there is this part of me mm -hmm. that fears bringing that out, that fears... Um, not being good enough to take on the task ahead of me, uh, that worries that I will do it in a way that ruins my opportunities of doing it right in a future iteration. Mm -hmm. And so I see it in myself and I see it in others, and it's a natural part. But in the archetypal work, just like in NLP or hypnotherapy, we can work with that part as another, as a, as a part, not us, a part. And in that way, we could do, I, I, I played with my clients, we did tapping on the uh, parts and uh, at one point. And, yeah. But the idea is really kind of the tap them on the shoulder and say, I'm with you. You're not alone. Well, absolutely. I think the, you know, even if we go all the way back to just a little Maslow uh, pyramid, mm -hmm. the idea of safety, safety is not alone. Yeah. Right? And so that's that's why I'm saying I think that that you're absolutely on it and that A, we have to model that for them. You know, oh, well, no dragon came out. Okay, good. Maybe I can is the implicit knowledge. Maybe I can survive that also. Maybe it's safe for me also. And then the other thing that you said that I find delicious and I'm so glad that Gary Craig put so much NLP into the, the EFT paradigm is that I must look at the parts because this, I, I can see the sum if I'm in a big, big picture mode, but mostly we can't. Like you said, we're rather myopic. And so the only honest way to deal with things is to deal with the parts, the part of me that. And often I do this when I'm in groups with people. You know, I'll go first. Mm -hmm. The part of me that. And the part of me that, and who else has another part? You know, tell me, I'll, I'll be the scribe. A part that what? Yes, and another part. And anybody else got, oh, and that part, right? And so in that, we come together and we are not alone and we see authentically, honestly, oh yeah, all of us have all of these parts sometimes. And they're all a part of this person, this energy, this entity that we've decided to rock this time. Um, I think that 
the parts work, as we used to call it in psych school, is just like the most helpful thing ever because it's incredibly honest. When we say wholehearted, I bet you if we looked hard enough, we'd find there was still a little part that was a little bit not sure. This is enough. This is right. What if? Right? So our journey to wholeheartedness has to include our partsness. Our partsness and not fear it. Mm. Yeah. Maybe that fear of being part of a collective, which is our cultural fear, where individualism mm -hmm. society is the fear of uh, the parts of our own nature that we have embattled or we have neglected or we've repressed or suppressed or hidden or I absolutely think that's true. I mean, I don't even remember who said it now, but so, so, someone very wise said once, the thing that you hate most in somebody else is the thing you hate most in yourself. And so there's a, you know, there's a piece of that that is uh, always operational. So I believe you've hit it on the head. Yeah, that's Carl Jung's um, theory of projections of shadows. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And in the model that uh, I see it very clearly, the middle of the fire when we bring our, the, the fire and the air realm are above the horizon line and they're very, the air being very uh, intellectualized and very thoughtful, mindful of how you relate to others and communicate in order to achieve and rise high. The fire realm is its complementary to that, which is the more intuitive side of our nature that um, is is, is more willful and more active, but it's it's getting in there and say, well, let's just, uh, like I think Richard Branson said, if you if you get the opportunity, take it and figure it out. Um, there is that that need for the hero to, to, to do before they learn, although they need to learn before they do sort of thing, but to jump into the fire and be willing to take the burn. So the first thing we meet are these external shadows. We call projected shadows or our projections, meaning others that battle up against us, mm -hmm. you know, professors that uh, question your allegiance and, and your sanity for having that allegiance for, yeah. let's say. Um, but all of these things are, are if they trigger you, if they even hit your radar, are, yeah. um, are clear indicators that down in the middle of the water realm that you have work to do. Mm -hmm. They become your, your sacred, your spiritual twins. They are your guide. Hmm. Right? That which goes ouch is your guide. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a lot of the work that, that we do in this particular iteration is, and where does that bring you? You know, how did you learn that? Tell me what was going on at the time that you learned that. It's, it's a nice way of saying Whatever that is, it's related to something that was earlier and that we should go find out. This is going to be really helpful. The trigger is your guide. The trigger is your teacher. Right? Of course, lest anyone misunderstand, I am not talking about asking that directly to triggered people at the moment that they are being triggered. <laughs> Just going to say that. You know, that's not very helpful. Yeah. <laughs> that is less than helpful. <laughs> yes. Yes. So these are parts of what you, um, uh, in this new process you're working with, these are some of the things that not only you encounter, but um, you, you have built in uh, operations to help them navigate that. Absolutely. And, and, and that's why I love this tool. Uh, number one, I think it's accessible. And th this tool being, for those of you who may have dropped in, this tool being a part of the energy psychology and energy medicine field that is commonly called tapping. And this particular iteration that I like best is being called emotional freedom techniques. Hmm. This toolbox, the best thing about it is how acceptable, excuse me, accessible it is. That's number one in my book. Also in my book, number two is its innate flexibility. You can be two years old, you can be 20 years old, you can be 200 years old. This is going to be wonderful. You can be in psychopathology, you can be in daycare. It's going to be wonderful. <laughs> and so these two things, I think, are its greatest feature. Okay. Uh, paradoxically, it's the thing that makes it the least 
helpful in clinical field trials because it is so flexible and because it's personal iterant is sort of a design feature the only way that you can actually use it in clinical field trial research is to do the equivalent of going give the researcher this paper have them read this paper in order do not vary from this paper because otherwise you can't isolate all the different variables that you would get you would you would still get to this marvelous result but that doesn't work so well in clinical field trial research which tells you something um, <laughs> but in in this tool set of asking really great questions and when I say really great questions I mean human questions of the heart human questions of of the consciousness as we grow into it along the line of, of actually what, what I had said before the tapping actually does the work of entering the nervous system and the limbic system wherein all those emotions are formed and um, labeled and revisited from earlier places that we store as memories not in our gray matter of course but all throughout our body every cell cellular memory right and so in accessing them we do that by stimulating any actually of the acupuncture points we just happen to use a way to get to pretty much every meridian in the system as a total tune-up concept instead of diagnostics which would mean would need to be more in the licensed world of of being able to to diagnose so we take that out gary took that out long ago as a stroke of brilliance and he goes oh if we don't diagnose you don't need any of that just let the tapping do the work and the work of the tapping to me is to loosen and start immediately entering this not only limbic system of ours but also the memory banks where all of our information is stored and when I say again memory banks I do mean it's all over the body but I'm just trying to talk efficiently here so it becomes very quickly accessible to us when I say things like and what is coming to you now about that right it's very conversational but it's a very human question because and neither do they until they're prompted and then they come out with it and they realize they do know they just don't know that they know right so in a sense our healing journey our guideness for them is to help them rediscover what they know that they don't know that they knew hmm. open inquiry absolutely so there's so much uh, so many rich traditions and tools within this elegantly simple deceptively simple algorithm because of what it does you know it's not about us and uh, here again we are aiding someone in processing what has happened or is happening for them but we're helping them to get in touch with just becoming open to receive that or re-receive it right or see it in a different way that's what the tool set is all about so fiery intuition can actually come up in this kind of inquiry because we're open to it we're tapping into it not to be too punny but we are we're tapping into this place this well of deep personal information and knowledge and maybe maybe if we stay with it be patient it it will show us its wisdom not just its knowledge right they say in the the elements that each one um, has this a genius that it's not just a, a chemical response or or the rest. It's actual. It's an intelligence. It's a, a, a god, if you will, within the the element that speaks to us. So it it has intention. It has directive. It has motive, and it knows the process. It knows um, how to draw you in. How to hold you and um, where it wants to uh, ideally lead you or ultimately refine you into the process. And yes, when we can drop into it, that, that genius does present. And yeah, I want to say inform you, inform, right? Inform, enlighten. It, it yeah. knows how to draw you in and it knows 
what its what its intention is if you ask me is to inform you to help you not just survive but thrive yeah like a good guide would do yeah like will draw guide you would into do. the experiences not walk for you mm -hmm. but do what it takes to draw you into the experiences that whether it's in the fire realm to draw you into these creative endeavors, put you out on stage so that you do go through this massive catharsis and, and transformation of being. The water realm would be more of drawing you into the, the nurturing connection with emotions so that then you sink into uh, these heavier, deeper uh, truths that are with shadowy truths that are within so you can do the work to transform them as well. It knows the process well. I remember being younger and, and this thought in my mind about this. People said, you're so devoted to this path. I said, I, I think it has me more than I have it. Uh, I'm just trying to keep up and, and show <laughs> up. <laughs> I like that. And, and honor it, right? Yeah. Honor, honor its existence or my understanding of it by, by participating fully. Um, I, what came up to my mind was the idea of in the past when we were more let's call them simple people, simple groups of people, um, we had these experiences and this, this uh, time element was very different. We had time without distraction to, um, you know, I don't want to get too poetic here, but I feel it very poetically, time to look at the stars and contemplate. What is that? Who am I? What is the meaning of this? We also had these, as you said, catharsis experiences where we had rites of passage. We had um, functionality as a goal and purpose that was easily discerned. Um, you know, my job is too. Our purpose is too. And that when we traveled, there's time and there's a journey and we understand that this journey, lots of things will happen. And when we return, we're bringing back lots of things for the, the good, the benefit, the group learning. And we just, we don't usually live in this kind of place anymore. So the, the obvious experience is you'll see some people, I'm not saying adrenaline junkies perhaps, but I'm saying people who deliberately go for heightened experiences in order to feel that and learn about themselves in this heightened state, right? And then we have people that, that want to go the opposite way in a decompressed state into retreat, into silence, right? Um, into a different warping of time, of their experience of time. And so all of those, though, I think are just what you said, that, that the guide takes you through those experiences as someone that you're trusting knows the way and can hold it together or uh, can hold it safely and hold your hand. You know, I, I am not alone. I have a guide. But the whole point is for us to go through experiences and be able to learn from them, internalize them, and then creatively spew forth this uh, very individualized iteration of the learning. And as I used to say, that's why there's so many of us. <laughs> we need right. all those ex iterations. We need all of them, and, and all of them, and, and that that issue of well, God, that's a uh, an important topic and distinction is um, uh, the importance and nature of diversity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As we simplify in our minds this process of being and becoming, um, the you know I was talking to a client recently, and uh, about how the more she sees in the world, the more contracted she gets and i said well that's a natural consequence for everyone if you try to possibly take in all the world events and if you've traveled you know mm -hmm. even if you traveled out of your own hometown the 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 novelty is can be overwhelming but this world is filled with all like the the buddhist uh saying all the good and bad is in the world it, it'll never change the dark the light it's all mm -hmm. there uh it's really a matter of what you focus on uh, that is what you will become because you will be influenced by it and you will be a uh, you'll be an energetic participant in that.
the energy realm the fire realm is uh is also seen as this energy realm as sad guru talked about the four yogis and that didn't get along very well it's a great video youtube video if you've never seen it just awesome. called the, the four yogis okay and this, the story is wonderful he said these four yogis do not get along uh one is um uh i forgot the different names but they're they're kriya yogi uh bhakti yogi and and uh jhana yoga or something but they each represent the four elements essentially okay. Uh, and the energy yogi looks at the others and says, well, you all got it all wrong. You're attending to matter and really everything is just energy patterns. Mm -hmm. And then the, of course, the intellectual yogi says, no, well, you're all just intellectually lazy. And it, really the world is all about getting your head straight and getting your mind straight. And the bhakti yogi, the earth yogi says, no, you're, you're all just lazy physically and creating all these philosophies to avoid hard work and and taking accountability of being human and the emotional yogi says well you're none of you have the emotional intelligence or depth so you're moving out into these these arenas to escape that and so anyway the four yogis are walking through the woods and a big storm happens and they're they need to escape this thunderstorm the bhakti yoga yogi knows uh, where a, a dilapidated temple is so he leads them there they all run there and the walls are down it's a small temple but they're hugging this deity to escape this the storm impending storm and in the midst of that they're not hugging it because they in love with the deity it's just there to get out of the storm but while they're there together god appears in the middle of the storm and of course, these yogis, they're, they're perplexed. Why now? They're all thinking the same thing. I've, I've trained my entire life intellectually, mentally, uh, emotionally, spiritually, and I haven't seen you once yet. But yet you appear in the middle of a storm. And his, uh, his, what God said to them was, well, it took this long to get you four idiots together. <laughs> you know, there's truly no separation of, of these uh, of these patterns, but the fire realm really is that representation of that energetic expression of who we are. And it, it is definitely one of the key features uh, of the fire realm that uh, that pointed me in your direction and many other things, but the energy and understanding how to be in relationship with the energy body, both as part of how we see ourselves and experience ourselves as an egoic being, which is vital, but also how we go out into the world and create. Now in astrology, the middle realm there is the fifth house, and it's a house of play, where the, the, the first house, the upper house of fire, is all about, uh, um, it's Aries, it's the ram at the top of the mountain saying, my way or the highway, buddy, you know, this is my game. Very self-possessed. We all need that quality, although there is a shadow to every one of them. But there's also that Mars character that says, yes, uh, the warrior says, let's go at it. But in the middle is Leo, the lion, the, the, the actress, the theatrical one. And the, fit, the middle of the fire, energetic expression, creativity, spiritual living into the world is seen, they, they would say in astrology, the best way to approach it is a, in a playful way, in a theatrical kind of way. And I, and I found it, uh, you know, very insightful as I started to decode a lot of the astrological. They're not only showing us some of the archetypal forces that typically dominate these arenas that we go into, but they're even saying, look, if you're going to be here, if you're out in and mixing it up and you're already on stage, just play. Hmm. Learn how to be more creative and expressive. And then in our, you and I, we were talking uh, about, in a conversation and you were talking about the power of play the importance of being playful working mm -hmm. with children and i'm like oh my god this this is something harvard had a whole program on uh on the power of play of course they use the word power because sure you know we are adults after all <laughs> <laughs> some days so what would you what would be some of the um uh you, we talked about it before in the first uh, uh interview but uh, what are some of the things you could speak to in terms of play and that you understand about uh, energy and play and creativity? Well, I, I, think, I think it's a really good time to talk about that because play is by its uh, 
my idea of play is by its nature open. Uh, anything could happen. I to. can be anything I want. Now let's do this. What if that? Mm. Right? It's all about this openness to creativity, imagination. So it's by its nature, play is open. Right? And to have uh, someone join you in play, you want to play with someone, then you are open to their suggestions too. Now let's do this. Right? We're riffing off each other in the best kind of play, the most satisfying kind of play is playing with, we are not alone. We are open, we're not alone, and anything can happen, but it's anticipatory. It's happy anticipatory. It's not, oh my God, anything could happen, fear or constriction. It's open and anticipatory and welcoming, pulling, magnetizing, right? And so there is great power in that, Thank you, Mr. Harvard. There is great power in that, but it's it's power of the power of its features embraced, right? Um, lived, used, taken out of the box. You know, not just seen through the glasses as, as uh, a static thing. We have to experience it. So, with a child, when they have not been shut down. They naturally do this. They are programmed to do this. Open investigation, right? Uh, that That's just how they're programmed, especially the first seven years. But theoretically, for 24, they're supposed to be open yeah. to this, to gather more information for their highest and best good, shall we say, in the world. Um, so with children that haven't been shut down, um, I think it is – the absolute way to work into their creativity and their power by inviting them to investigate it with you, beside you, with you, right? If they have been shut down, then our job gets a little bit more complex in that we have to, in my mind anyway, we have to reestablish trust and safety that it's okay to do that, to awaken, to open up again, to bring forth that has been shut down. Right? Otherwise, we can't really play. That shutdownness is a closedness that says, what do you want from me? What do I need to do now in this moment to keep myself safe? Right? What do I need to do in order to get what I need to survive? That's a reaction. Mm -hmm. So somehow we have to build that trust. Uh, these tools are very good for having private investigations and processing because that kind of person, let's call them a child, uh, typically is in a double bind, right? I'm, I'm damned if I do and damned if I don't would be the adult way of saying the double bind, but they've been told to keep secrets, Right? The open secret is no one can know, and, and, and nobody even tells you that. You just grow up in the culture. No one can know that this goes on, right? Um, the typical everyday closed secret is, you know, if you tell mom, you are dead, right? A, a sibling kind of thing. But then, of course, it gets darker and darker and darker, doesn't it, out in the world as the the secret or the shutdown or the you can't tell – makes a more and more densely compacted little soul. I, it's Holy. no less powerful, but it doesn't know of its power at that point until it explodes. So I don't know how come, but astronomy suddenly, suddenly got involved in this analogy. Um, big bang, a birth of a new world. The possibility. Right. And, you know, if you hook that to what we're talking about, that, that could be very deadly. Yeah. Right. Or it can be very liberating. It is totally at both ends of the spectrum possibility. But let's talk again, you know, just about the play function. That is helping them embrace all of the four elements in, in your, your chart. Mm -hmm. And in EFT language, uh, for me, the tapping is what processes down the funnel, the spiral, to, ma to make a new. I could be remembering anew. I could be creating anew. I'm not sure what's going to happen. There again, I don't know yet. That's the delicious part of it. I don't know what we'll find, little one. 
but I can tell you that you're not alone. I can tell you that I'll walk with you. I can tell you that I'll do my very best to help you with whatever you thought you would like. Right. So all of these things about uh, play are, I think, built in us as information-seeking, learning, and expansionary uh, parts of our equipment. And I didn't mean to derail us by any chance, but I wanted to show you how quickly and how easily we are shut down from one of our most important uh, intake and learning elements that we're born with. It's a big deal because we need to understand what are the impediments to uh, successful creativity and being able to play, which we are so lacking in our culture. I, I, I find it now that I have young children, it's, it's clear in myself. I thought I was very playful. How, how many times have you heard somebody say to you, I don't have a creative bone in my body? Mm -hmm. It's a very popular mantra, but it tells me, ah, someone shut you down when you shared, someone has judged you or humiliated you or told you you weren't entitled or whatever. And I don't say that to them, obviously, but it's just a, such a large clue to me that I have learned creativity and play is unsafe. Hmm. Right. It reminds me of a student who came to one of my courses in, in um, the Catskills. And, and um, I was teaching a course in... Uh, imaginal work and and the shamanic mm -hmm. uh, potential and the imaginal that all is created through the imaginal and it was a, it's sort of the beginning of me sharing some of the tools I used but uh, he had mistaken the course for uh, a plant medicine uh, uh, mm -hmm. workshop so he thought we would be taking some sort of hallucinogen Mm. Uh, to access these shamanic states of consciousness. Mm. And, you know, so we started this conversation. He says, well, it's, in, I, he says, it's, it's impossible to comprehend how, um, you know, our, our imaginations are so feeble. They can't really get us accessing these states of consciousness. And I said, well, I do it daily. And I said, well, here's the one thing that I, I ask you. What aspect of your life that you're not making up, that you're not imagining? Everything you can imagine about reality is a creative construct that you've created. So, in fact, you're very powerful. You've created even that illusion. Mm -hmm. And that's a very complex illusion that you're not making it all up. You know, this work says, let's, let's remember that we have been making all this up. And now say, what do you want to make up? I like that. So, moving from the shared contagion of... We're all sitting around here, aren't we? <laughs> to, <laughs> to, and now that we uh, have agreed upon that, what shall we do with it? Yeah, yeah. What should we do with it? And we, we could do anything. We could play. And I, the, the Martin Buber concept of God being more between us mm. than within us, it's, I think that's part of the motif. That's part of the, the wisdom that's coming through. And uh, I, I talked about it before with this wonderful book by Grant Maxwell, all the dynamics of transformation, he looks across uh, the pre-modern, uh, classical, modern, and in postmodern phases, and, and where we're heading. What is this post-postmodernism? And you know, coming away from this sort of fractured sense of we'll just do whatever you want. Mm. I guess you don't have to be uh, Jewish or Catholic or Hindu or but but do whatever you want. I don't even care. You can stand on your head if you like, and some do. And, but this is saying something different. This is say, yes, do, do what you're called to do. Follow your bliss because there's something in the field that is holding space for us, that's intelligent, that's guiding us all together. How did we meet? How do we, you see these synchronicities? I guess one of the great laws is we synchronicity. How do we find each other and what is governing that? And there is this beginning process of becoming aware of that, um, not just the God within, but the God between, the, the mm -hmm. field of intelligent, um, uh, what do they call it, like the morphogenetic field or... Uh, right. they, they, they call it the field of all possibility. They call it the field, the quantum field. I mean, it's got many names, as it should, I think. Mm -hmm. Right? But I do particularly like the field of all possibilities uh, oh. because it keeps, it keeps me very big picture and open. I think, 
um, and that that between that whole idea of between is is so beautifully played out by those in the quantum world of which I am not I, I understand maybe two sentences of that uh, except intuitively but the idea that there is absolutely nothing and everything out there between the things we can see you know everything and nothing is a beautiful way to express that which we cannot get our minds around presently yeah I think Heisenberg said, uh, "If you if you think you understand quantum theory, uh, you don't uh, you don't know nope. it. <laughs> don't it's a beautiful that. thing, right? <laughs> or, uh, yeah, or it's, uh, maybe it was uh, uh, Richard Feynman who I also loved. I, I was going to say it could have been his six easy things or six easy pieces. I'm not sure, but I love uh, him. Yeah. I, I love his. You know, I have I have I have um, a tentative thoughts and I have." you know, the sense of probable outcomes, and he really gets into the fuzzy logic of reality, which, again, leads us back into this playful space of, I don't know, let's find out. Let's exactly, exactly. And I think that that childlikeness is what we're talking about. The best possible version of childlikeness is, wow. Wonderment. Wonderment. And and I think that's what I, w I was talking to you last time about, is, I think it's Brian Green. Ta talking about the the heart of the cosmos is just like, the wow factor is is something that when we don't visit it enough we lose wonder yeah right and wonder is transformative generative uh, creative energy producing and i think everybody who's ever thought of anything gobsmacking in the world has been in a wonder flash and it just opens up the, the the dilation. Everything opens up to be receptive. Yes. To say, I like, uh, I you know, Christ said to be like a child, mm -hmm. to enter the kingdom of heaven, which is within. Yes. It, you have to be like a child, and it certainly isn't. Um, do what you're told. <laughs> it's to realize you don't know, right. and that there is a beautiful world of learning yet to be had. There's adventure afoot. Yes. Yes, I love that adventure afoot. I do. And and just, you know, just listening to you talk about that. It, it's not just your face and your body language or whatever, but you are weaving that reality with just what you say in, in my book. There's adventure afoot, carries with it a supercharged, I don't know if I were a quantum person, I'd know what that is, but it's a supercharged <laughs> uh, missive of energy out into the world. And that openness receives it. Yeah. The closeness doesn't even feel it go by, I don't think. It can't. To, to receive and then to transmit. Mm -hmm. And in the space between, uh, William James says, uh, uh, the big, it's something like the big miracle of our generation is uh, we realize that uh, we can change our thoughts and in a moment. Yeah. And in that moment, we change our reality. There you go. And so that, that gets into the whole concept of neuro, neuroplasticity mm -hmm. and uh, the ability, as you were saying. I, I see, and I'd love to get your thoughts on what are some of the, the ways that you've seen EFT and your work and mentoring through the EFT and the rest, how uh, you've seen it. Uh, shift because I've seen my clients. Oh my God, they have such a fixed perspective. I I, I remember uh, with one of my clients, he was a, um, a law enforcement guy, an older guy, uh, but he still had a relationship with his mother was that was very challenging, and to the point where every day he would slam the phone down after talking with her. You know, and it was it was very intense. There was still that 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 kind of childlike um, little boy stuff there. You know. And uh, we did the, the tapping and said, on a scale of zero to 10, how intense is this feeling of, of being subjugated or this animosity? He goes, it's a 10. He, no, he said it's a thousand, I don't know. But, uh, and, and then when we were done uh, with the first round, mind you, he, I said, so on a scale of zero to 10, where is it now? And, he's, and I see his eyes darting around looking for it. But I see in his whole composure something has shifted there was a a sense of peace that came over him because that bubble of that had that been so sacredly held and and protected never questioned just reacted to reaction is not a defense against it it's it's a in a in a in a very real way a way of empowering the very thing 
you're trying to escape from, right? Mm -hmm. So he's he's holding this without ever looking it in the face to unravel it. He just said, no, uh, she makes me mad. <laughs> but in this tapping, this simple process, and, and I think there's power in the repetition, uh, just yeah. like with Ho'oponopono or something like this. Repetition mm -hmm. has a way of diffusing it as well. But he came out of it, and I saw him searching for it. And I said, well, what is it? it? He says, I, hold on, hold on, please, just give me a moment. I'm looking for it. I know it was a big deal. I'm not making this up. I'm not crazy. And then I, after a while, he's like, I, I don't know what to tell you. It's a two. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, Gary Craig calls that, that they're unable to bridge with their mind, their present reality, and that thing that just happened. Oh, they're not so able to put those two things together. And that's where we have what I think Roger Callahan, where TFT came from, said, uh, maybe called that the apex effect. I am unable to put those two things together. Therefore, it must be something else. And so the apex effect is what we laughingly call when somebody goes, you know, I think all that yoga is really starting to to click in <laughs> after <laughs> after you've been doing this whole other modality with them for two hours, right? Or <laughs> 10 minutes, doesn't matter. Um, oh, but God, the, that's a big one, yeah. But the apex effect is hilarious, right? And so you just go with it, you know? Why, why fight that? Let, let them come to that. But observing the shift is what you're talking about because it is simply not there. Energetically, emotionally, it is simply not there. In my estimation, it's because the information has been received. And therefore, the sensation or the driver, uh, the symptomology, whatever you want to say about that, no longer needs to exist, and therefore it does not. The dread to repeat is removed because the energy beyond, behind, and, and I think there's a very, obviously it's got to be natural because it's, it's, it's endemic, right? Yeah. So there is this, um, this pattern that says, you're not going to get beyond this until you move through this. The lesson's not done until you've been able to release Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And I think that's a universal lesson. This is why you keep dating the same person, you know? Mm, yep. this, this is it. Um, but it's it's also, I, I, I really think it's important for them to know that symptomatically, that is why that is going off. Because if you're not paying attention here, then I'm going to up the ante. I'm going to turn it up. I'm going to... I'm going to start screaming if you won't listen to me. Yeah. And that happens, I think, all the time. So when it is taken away, it simply ceases to exist because its job is done. Yeah. I well, have now, your attention. With, uh, with Carl Jung's work in sandbox therapy, mm -hmm. uh, he proved very well that quite often um, the, the answer or the antidote, it's not going to necessarily come into, in an arena that you're familiar with. If you're an artist, you might want to try expressing yourself through music. And, um, you know, and looking at it elementally, uh, you know, we have this, um, this uh, sort of, uh, I, I think, a bit of a fixation around the air realm, around cognition, uh, cognitive behavioral, which is air and fire. Uh, mm -hmm. Looking at, if we can just look at our thoughts and look at our behavior rationally, and analyze them and reason with them and then come up with a pithy insight, uh, we can correct it. And there is there is definite value in that. But sometimes it's in uh, shifting to the water realm and doing something very imaginal, something very emotionally or very feminine and inductive mm -hmm. rather than deductive that is going to be the thing. With the EFT, I see very much the fire realm stuff of energy. I mean, that is so inductive on its own terms. How is it? I say to my clients, how is it that 10 minutes ago or 15 minutes ago, you had a 10 rating of depression. You said you were going to go on an antidepressants. You couldn't get out of this funk. And now it's 15 minutes later and it's down to a two. What happened to your depression? And they're mm -hmm. like, I don't know. They and don't. The other, and they're telling you the truth. They do not. Yeah. The other question I say, I, I think is a very important one is what does it say about our, our capacity to self-write and about that within this biocomputer, within this beyond the biocomputer, that's just a me mechanistic way of looking at mm -hmm. this, this intelligent soul that is a result of, of, of eons of, of family lineage and wisdom passing through and beyond that, the wisdom of the universe coursing through us as a microcosmos of the whole. What does it say when we recognize that we too 
can participate in the field of the gods, that we can um, simply, <laughs> in the most mundane way, we can tap these meridian points and that that truly objectively it's phenomenological yes you feel differently but that's why i assume they added the the left brain analytical part to the quantitative part of scale rating it because your left brain says wait a minute yeah you might feel better but i don't trust that but i do trust that i scaled it at 10 now it's a two and that's convincing well, I do think that that part of the experiential and then hooking it to a cognitive rational uh, scale of I tested it, it was this way, it's not this way. Um, you know, I don't, I use numbers, but I don't use them as much mm. because I find that they, they tend to be sometimes, you know, past, past this very simple use for them, they, they tend to uh, not be as illustrative to the person. And so what I want to say is, you know, what's your sense of how that affects you? It's like, and then pff, we're into the magical realm of the metaphor. It was like this constant black cloud over my head that I can't escape from. Wow. Well, honey, that makes me a lot happier than you saying nine. <laughs> so wait, this is news to me, uh, John D. You... You have broken out of that. And well, I, I do think it has. I would love to take all that credit. Thank you. But i uh, not going to do it because I believe that what all these people, including Gary, were trying to set up is the idea, Gary especially, the idea that this type of, let's call it psychological treatment for self-care, uh, or even in therapy offices was one of the few that could quantify to the person in real time that the shift happens, right? And so it's, it's one, one of the only ones that I know of that insist that we're going to test this little thing until we know for sure, because otherwise we're in the business of questioning ourselves. That's what we do, right? We and so, not analyze. Right. And so in my book, and not just my book, but let's just talk about my book. Tell I me went, about your book. Oh, you? well, and, and remind me of that in just a second. Okay, I need sorry. to finish this thought. The, the idea is I went, oh, we need to test it in a meaningful way so they know for themselves that this is helpful. Oh, okay. So what's your sense of how big it is, how much that bothers you? What, what could you say about how this is affecting you right now? It does two things. One, it creates a meaningful assessment. And two, it anchors in a real time right now instead of, well, you know, 20 years ago or when it happened or well, if it happens again, you know, that is very unhelpful. And so two things, meaningful to you, measurement of some kind and anchoring you in the present experience. That's what I believe that really good EFT does for you. Okay. And so that's where I understood the power of the metaphor is where I want to go mostly because mm -hmm. the quantification for them is very personalized. And if they can tell me it went from that feeling like I have a black cloud over my head all the time from which I cannot ex escape to uh, I just feel buoyant. You know, who am I to judge that except to, sh to, to know that as the guide, I was a person that was instrumental in taking that journey with them to somewhere else that's better in their book. Isn't that one of, I think, one of the challenges that that this type of work uh, uh, presents to the prevailing orthodoxy of psychotherapy is that it's not about us knowing, it's about them knowing and them experiencing. And Absolutely. that change is that qualitative shift is meaningful. As a, we look at Milton Erickson's work, He's, he uses mm -hmm. terminology that comes from them. He doesn't, if they say they hope to feel more courageous. He doesn't say, well, I hope you feel more empowered now. No, he uses the word. <laughs> words are sigils. They, they're magic. They come from them. 
That's right. And and I would say it the best the best iterations of EFT are completely dependent on understanding the client's experience is the only thing that counts. The only thing. The only thing. Yeah. You're anything else you're in the way. Absolutely. If we're not facilitating, what are we doing? And that, that's one of the so challenges. So guide is, guide is different, right? Guide, guide is, is different than anything you want to do. Yeah. It's very different than that, but yet what you said, right? Yeah. Well, in the work that I do with clients, uh, we go through, it depends, depends on where they're at. We go from where they are. So if they're in the middle of the water realm, that's where we go. Mm -hmm. And you, utilizing, of course, the tools that work best in that arena but we always contextualize it saying you're here going through this kind of gauntlet mm -hmm. you've been here you went to here and it's to help you get to this next qualitative state so there is sort of this meta view anticipation that anchors in this anticipation of results happening and a gift coming through so there's that meta but when we drop into that one there's always this sort of dialectics between um, you know, thesis antithesis are, are their projected desires and their feared um, shadows. And each of theirs, whether it's identity or whether uh, it's coming to this emotional sense of some inner truth, there is this, this maybe an inner truth they're feeling like, yes, I do have a deep inner truth, but the reason I don't want to get to it is not because I'm self-flagellating in that level. I want that. But next door is this dragon this dragon, this dark dragon. And so we hold those up as counterpoints um, where they want to be. This part of you wants to achieve this, but this part of you threatens to drown you. Mm -hmm. What would happen? What is the synthesis that comes from, you know, what is the resolution here? And it is very qualitative. It is a, you know, they call it chunking up and, and, uh, and down and down. Right. Yes. It's I getting mean, to something deeper or something higher that's the intention behind these phenomenon. I, I think that's well said. It is on a scale, on a vertical scale. It is both, and it slides effortless, effortlessly. It's it's, <laughs> it slides up and down, chunking up. So knowing all this, what could you say about that now, right? And it also chunks all the way down. And under that, and under that, and more specifically, that means... And how is that for you? And and right now, the the, the feeling of that, or the the uh, location of that, going off in reflection in your body right this moment, it's like smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, because at its essence, EFT is a deconstruction tool. And what you and I learned in psychology school, if I may be so bold as to speak for you too, is an additive experience, a synthesizing experience. And so I routinely tell the licensed people who come through my classes, this tool is your upside down tool. And you will purposefully want to use it when you want to deconstruct something instead of make meaning, which is an additive or constructive way. And so I, I, I see it as purposefully deconstructive, which is going to be really helpful. <laughs> right? Otherwise, it's the whole ball of wax, the whole bowl of spaghetti. And I go, you know, how is that working for you? <laughs> right? It's the only thing that I actually like that Dr. Phil says. So how's that working for you? How's that working for you? Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me, I was reading the kids uh, recently uh, through the looking glass darkly. Nice. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, there's this, uh, the uh, upside down world, the, the other realms. Mm -hmm. I think we're ready for that. I, I mean, and, and certainly in the model, that's there's so many things about it that help me, uh, but mostly it helps me. Um, it's a model for synthesizing all of the different models that I work with, uh, different traditions, ancient, modern, but left hemisphere, right hemisphere, uh, fire and water representing the right, and left and right are air and earth. Uh, but there is this um, this other dichotomy, as you were talking about, air and fire being above the horizon, ego future-oriented, constructive, projective, and that sort of thing. But the feminine counterpoint is the earth and water, and it's, and it's holding. It's, it's holding uh, space for something generative new to come through. But it's also the water realm of cleansing, of, of inductive, open-ended connection to source. And, and, and you know, the, the, the different traditions from the shamanic way, uh, they talk about this three-part self. So 
in the middle, right at the crosshairs, would be conscious self. Mm-hmm. And the and the the huna they talk about uh, that being the uhani self, the, the conscious self. Mm-hmm. And then there's this upper self up in the top of the fire and air, which would be considered more the amakua, the higher self. And the amakua is connected to the po amakua, the council of higher selves. So this sort of spiraling out into this collective source of wisdom from the heavenly realms. But the, so it's like a, a Taurus and all of that comes funneling down into the Uhani conscious self heart centered. And it opens back up and spirals back and kind of roots out into the lower self down that vertical axis at the bottom of the spiral uh, that they would consider the, the Una Hapili, the basic self. It's a very simplified notion. But so even if we're in that central axis of self, which is very introverted when we're in there, you can't see anything going on uh, from the outside, but you can rise from the center of stillness up to this higher level and all the traditions to connect with what we would consider maybe our higher self, Amakua. Mm-hmm. But we can also descend down into that intelligent source that is part of our embodiment as a human brain, being called the Unhapili, this 90-something percent of us that is very much, at best, a third grade child. And so, you know, my clients, I tell them, they say, well, this is ridiculous. I'm an intelligent person. I say, yes, <laughs> but do you remember every turn you took getting here, driving here? Uh, what were you thinking about on your way here? I bet you know that more than um, all the things that took place while you're driving. We tend to drive very automatically we, mm-hmm. we have, we have, because we have an autopilot. Exactly. And autopilot does a lot of work for us. And I think a lot in this work is, is sort of diffusing a lot of the alarm bells and the, the old patterns. I, I see in my, my work there this, this sort of notion that uh, looking at Peter Levine's work and trauma therapy and the rest, and that when there is a very strong experience beyond just trauma, something strong enough to impress itself on our central nervous system, I look at it like a Um, It it resonates and it creates a spherical sort of nodal point that becomes an archetypal sort of situation in itself that says this type of situation exists in the world. Mm -hmm. And the point of it is that it's tapped into our central nervous system. It's like grapes on a vine. And they're watching, all of them independently watching for contextual cues that are similar to the original event. Just enough. If you're mugged crossing a, um, uh, through a blind alley, every you could be on your iPhone 20 years later and you still jump when you see somebody come out. Why? Because that turned from a grape to a sphere of influence. And so I see that very much in the energetic work and energetic healing and energy psychology is we're able to tap into that and to conjure it up and to hold it both in right brain experiential, inductive, big picture, whoa. Mm-hmm. And we do know, of course, in, in research that it's not the left brain analytical reductive earth and air side of us that actually changes our habits, our habitual mind. It's really the right brain. Exactly. But moreover, I think, I think it's sitting in that corpus callosum between the two that is the, the, the middle path that is really mm-hmm. where the work is. And so I love that with the EFT, it's holding both the rational left brain, the analytical, and the inductive, big picture, messy, scary, um, theatrical. I, I do love that. And, and another way of looking at it along the same lines is um, that you're not finished with that yet. This is unfinished business, right? So unfinished business goes in our hippocampus. Why? Because we're not finished with it yet. It, and if we look at, you know, I'm no brain scientist, but from what I understand, the idea is we want an efficient machine. And so we have evolved into this efficiency machine so that as quickly as possible, all my cogitation energy is um, going to be expended on something new or novel until I figure it out or match it with something. And then it goes shuttling into in my perception, the the short or long-term storage file rooms, right? And so the brain's goal, and I guess I'm talking uh, primarily about the PFC now, but the the goal is as quickly as possible uh, and is with as little energy as possible, identify, catalog, and file this. And now I have my standby for Tiger's brain 
and all the energy that I have left, it, it's, it's there and I'm ready. It's almost like, uh, oh, that's so funny. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this uh, picture at the home plate, right? <laughs> I'm ready to receive. Whatever you got throw at me, I'm ready. I'm ready. But we can't do that if something is unresolved. And in Peter Levine's uh, case, he calls the threat response cycle that is incomplete, right? It makes perfect sense to me. And so it would still be in my hippocampus. It's unfinished business. And it's also right there so that the minute something that matches that unfinished threat cycle, it's going to, in EFT talk, trigger me in the same way because it's still there in a threat response mode. So whatever's going on. Temple Grandin did a lot of great work around this from her autistic background, put that to work for animals, right? And so when I have a great love of cows and things like that, because uh, I grew up around them, but that simple creature is, is so heightened to novelty, right? Mm -hmm. And so the novelty scares the scares them and they scatter right but if they are to see something hanging on the the fence post that's enough to prevent me from going forward right so people are very much like that when they start looking at it or let's say before it was a yellow jacket hanging there and now it's just a little piece of yellow plastic but still it's there and let's not talk about colorblind and all that i maybe got the wrong analogy but the idea is i am an associative creature as our uh, a lot of mammals. And so my doggy brain, my mammalian brain, my limbic system, my middle brain, all the same thing, they are associative all the time. And so what EFT so beautifully does is finds where the associations are and all of what in EFT is called aspects, which are pieces of this experience. And now where I think uh, Peter Levine's work ends and Robert Scares begins is the idea of Robert Scares neurology experiments over the years and his deep thinking on this is that we create the equivalency of a trauma capsule and the trauma capsule is a way of saying an encapsulation of that event and absolutely every piece of data that was taken in at that time, just before, through, and just after. The reason that we encapsulate is so we can escape. I can't really contemplate this right now. I have to get out of the house. I have to get out of the car. I have to do these things. I have to run like hell. Um, I'll think about that later is the equivalency of that encapsulation, which is a survival feature. What happens when I get out of that experience and everything is fine and I'm clear in the clear, that's when it starts to leak because it's trying to complete the threat response cycle. But all the billions of data bytes in there are not actually the problem. It's, it's actually probably a handful of those that are still activated, right? But our beautiful system is just designed to take in and Sorry. like that. Oops. Oh, it's her, our, our dog's favorite friend, the mailman. Oh. Hey, come here, baby. Speaking of uh, uh, trigger, come here, baby. Come. Hi. Come. Oh, can you see? Oh, you can't see her. She's yeah. down there all activated. Hi there, baby. <laughs> Hi there, pretty blue eyes. It's okay. This is um, talking about immediate trigger. Poor baby. That is just. Look at that, that look on her face like, oh, Aww. my God, your friend's out there. What's he going to do with Jeffrey? <laughs> oh, oh, baby. Jeffrey brings her treats. and I was just going to say, I hear her reading her favorite book called There Might Be Treats. Oh, oh, oh and it just can't be helped, can it? Mm -mm. <laughs> now, I have been conditioned to Jeffrey. Yes, she has. Oh, I'm sorry, baby. She, he's, he's already long gone now. I'm sorry we missed that boat. Right. <laughs> yeah, well. Um, and so taking a beat, the way in which our body perceiving possible threat opens up the floodgates of sensory detail amassing is 
just a thing of beauty when you think about it. Every possible piece of information that I might need is becoming hyper available to me. Unfortunately, if we can't complete that threat cycle, that threat response cycle, and it all washes away into a, a file cabinet that is not activated, we have this hippocampi experience where it's still going on. And this is, in fact, the, the textbook idea about the veterans that we work with in EFT. Prolonged exposure is not helping this, folks. No. That's why the dropout rate is huge. Because who wants to do that all the time without resolution? All it's doing is just grinding it in, right? Same old thing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the bad version of Groundhog Day, the movie. So this is what we're up yeah. to, yeah. is encountering all of these somatic, emotional, sensory, all these details, and finding out. I know it's not every single billion aspects. It's a few. Which one is most present to you now? And then we process it together. That is what we're doing. So you, what rises is what's uh, in the field. What is heightened for you, right? In this moment. And it's always about in this moment because that unfinished thing is still in this moment because it's unfinished. I like that. It's very Taoist in the sense that, um, you know, if you go uh, it, in the, the Qigong master, you, you say, I'm feeling anxious. They, they won't get into the external context of, what's triggering your anxiety, unless it's some immediate threat to them as well. But generally speaking, they say, well, that's associated with the uh, spleen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're going to work directly on releasing that dark chi or whatever is binding it up because when it's in a bad way, it creates this effect that we recognize as an energetic response is, or yeah, an energetic response of anxiety, stress, worry. And the beautiful thing, just like with EFT, the results are practically immediate. Right. There is, there is no wondering if it works or not. So true. And the meridian we're accessing in the algorithm is uh, the spleen is included, you know, along the triple warmer. Why? Because it is the one that is activated with that sense of anxiety or threat or whatever. In this moment. Right in this now. moment, right now. And there is nothing else. I, I, I think that's my favorite part of the, the I, I guess I would call it also the Taoist of it or the, even the Zen of it, is that there is only the now and let us deal with the now. Well, and in the bigger picture of it, developmentally, culturally speaking, I could see the, the value of these movements. And, you know, and there's this, you know, the unified field theory, uh, I'm very much like the model I work with, has a sort of toroidal sort of movement to life. Everything is going through this torus. We know that cells have a, uh, healthy cells have a defined center and the nucleus, and there is this torus of energy flowing in and out like an apple core of energy, mm -hmm. right? And, in, and there is this idea that going past a tipping point at the top of the torus is called the event horizon. And there is this drawing in then of the spiraling in. You can see the black and white balls spinning in. And you could see it funneling into this omega point. In the middle of the apple is that place where the seeds of transformation occur. And, and it funnels in, and those balls not only move faster in that cycle, but they are moving quicker together, and they're tightening together blah, 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 all the way in. And there's zones, as I see it. In each of these phases, there's zones. And the zone out here at the beginning of the event horizon where these sort of polarized opposites are dialectically dancing in this big swing, maybe it takes every 17 years to come back full circle to the thing you started with. As we're going through this refining process, it's spiraling in and it becomes every seven years, every five, every two. And at this point, in some ways, culturally, we're in that uh, exponential speeding up point of that, what some say are getting to that omega point of some massive change happening. And in this zone, the tools and the way of practicing and the way we approach this must um, be in resonance with the needs and accord of that arena. This, what we're having here was not uh, what we could do 17 years of psychoanalysis with in the 50s. 
Right. And and the beauty of that is, was it correct? Or was it not correct? No, it's absolutely beautiful. I, I would have preferred to see more of the Jungian work come through because that's my bias. But uh, the Freudian work brought up all of the repressed Victorian sexuality and all of these things. They had their plays. Yeah. And I think in the work, and we're looking in terms of this work, is how do we uh, create an eclectic approach to our work that really honors all the wisdom that's out there beyond our own sort of specialization and hold space for all that wisdom to inform us without co-opting, to inform without derailing. Well, I think you're back to the open mind again, are yeah. you not? The idea in EFT, well, let's say the best EFT mm -hmm. stance is they are where they are. You meet them where they are emphasis on they right in order to do that going right back to what you're saying one has to have the open mind to just not judging it that is where they are our job is to meet them where they are with the openness because we don't know and neither do they but we will we will find out what they do know we'll help them find out what they do know now you and see that automatically important. happening with uh, with the doing the 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 intervention the the practice. Absolutely, um, I I know this must be so, and I know this must be valuable because I cannot count on my digits. How many times people have said, <laughs> "I just don't feel judged," hmm. or "This is the first time I felt like it's okay to just say this." Wow. Right, and to me that that that's that's music, because that means it's a good thing you got up today, because this person needed to feel unjudged for once in their life, and to be able to say their truth safely and note that the consequences were not there, the negative consequences rather were not there for saying their truth. I I just had somebody tell me who's older than me. I have to tell you, and I have to tell you first, I was able to tell my story to my family, and I've never, ever been willing to do that before. And I'm still alive. I mean, it's just like it was ultimate freedom for them. I think that's why, the, the, you know, the, these that's techniques huge. that I'm – it is huge. It means that, that – that person has come into their own emotional freedom and blossoming and, and they're, they're able to live now, right? I don't know anything more about it than that. I don't necessarily need to. It just means that you were able to guide them and walk with them to this place where they could do that thing. As you can tell, I get into a lot of pronouns. Just very, I find them very useful. Mm -hmm. That thing, this place. It's an important thing. I, you know, I did uh, this training with uh, remote viewing, uh, mm. this CIA-based program. And, right. and the, the big part of getting these very left brain people, very analytical, mm -hmm. to go into that very right brain function of being able to see into things, to actually see not just uh, qualitative things, but actual experience, anything you can photograph. Mm -hmm. And a big part of it you learn is, is essentially playing charades with yourself. And breaking the fixation, they would say, okay, go 10 feet away from the target, and what do you imagine experiencing? Now go uh, 15 minutes ahead, go mm -hmm. 20 minutes behind. And so they're looking for all of these places around this, this sort of crystal of reality and saying, let's look at all these different facets. And what's interesting is you'll hit the target every time. I mean, I hit every one of the targets, but I didn't see the whole crystal. I saw all the facets. Mm -hmm. They knew what they were looking for and they got what they needed. But there is a sort of playing charades with yourself. And one of the initial parts of it, this is kind of neat. I think it's an interesting thing it says about our brain. The first thing that you do in the upper right hand corner, they'll bring a, um, a random number to you on a little sticky paper. And It'll be 543297 or something like that, just a random number that's been created. And in another building on a ledger, that same sequence of number is attached to a photograph and an and a outline of what that is. Hmm. It could be uh, anything you can take a picture of, uh, a person on a horse or an event or whatever it is, or, or a landscape. Okay. And and so the first thing they do is bring this to you and they say, now I want you to look at it. And in the upper right-hand corner, 
I want you to write everything you think it is. Just let let your imagination run free. And so I'm like, okay, well, it was, I remember first going in and, and I was very fanciful. And I'm like, okay, I, I don't know why, but I see the Kremlin, okay. Um, I, I suppose it's a Kremlin, but okay, where? And then he says, keep going. And I go in, I go into a filing cabinet, pull out this top secret thing. And, and I go through this whole process. I'm really, really, my some part of me, my ego is really kind of getting into it. Now, that's the garbage can. There is this initial instinct that we have, and it's very ego-oriented to quickly come up with an insight, but mm -hmm. quite often it's based on erroneous assumptions and mm -hmm. bad data. It's just like I, I need to figure it out so quickly, but in this very um, particular type of work where you have to be very precise, um, that does not work. And then underneath, to your point, uh, he would say, okay, now I want you to, now that you did that, let's move on. I want you to draw on this part of the paper with your hand. As you look at the numbers, let your hand just free draw until you're done. And then over here, you write down what you wrote. And then, but you can't use language like I, I drew a big circle and a zigzag. You say, my hand went up to the right and kind of squiggled to the left. And it says ifness. It's still very right brain qualitative. And then even after you get into it, you don't want to say, I, I see um, the Southwest and I see, uh, you know, uh, these arid stones. No, you say it's stone-like. Yes. It's pronouns. It's, it's, it's this kind of thing is thingedness. And you stick with that because over-definition creates this bias effect in, in reporting. Absolutely. I think that is a great point. I've never heard anyone come at that from the remote viewing standpoint, but there, there, there is a precedent for exactly that kind of thing at mass that, that we do when we borrow heavily from Hawkins work and, and uh, from yes. art therapy and things like that, where we talk about, um, you know, the mark that I made, hmm. right? The kind of color that, the green that is you know, that kind of thing, because it's, it's to me, because it's opening again, here we are back to the open mind. It's, it's opening up to receiving more meaning from that, accessing the meaning perhaps even that you've already made that you're not aware of. But the thingedness is, uh, I'm going to be using that. I like that. I thingedness. love it. The thingedness. Right. Well, isn't that the nature of fire? The candle lights up a room and it could be spread. Mm -hmm. There is, it's like in the, um, the Kabbalistic tradition, it's like that consciousness that illuminates, mm -hmm. that part of our conscious mind that illuminates reality and just receives the reflection. I like that. Yeah. And, and, the, and that idea, for better or worse, the reflectiveness, for better or worse, right? It is reflective mm -hmm. of what I'm thinking Whatever. it might be. It's reflective of what I think you want. Hmm. What do you right. see? Hmm, maybe. Mm -hmm. It must mean something. <laughs> right? Yeah. That's interesting. And it's interesting that you see it that way. And, 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 and it's interesting that it, what I see reflected is this. I wonder what that means. And I wonder what's between there. Yeah. But, just holding space for, I see this. I wonder what that means. I don't know that that's ultimate reality. And in fact, at this age, you and I are both quite certain that um, it's, it's just a reflection of, of a perception. And, and we like that because it allows us to be able to have these conversations where we say, I've had these experiences. And, you know, at, at Carl Jung was asked once, and I love this interview, uh, he was asked, some woman said very pointedly, do you really believe all this? And he said, you know, it's a very, it's a very com perplexing question to be asked. <laughs> and, said, and he thought about it for a moment. He says, I don't have beliefs. I have experience. Mm. And I'm just offering my experience. I'm an explorer. I'm a journeyer. And this is what I've seen and witnessed. Mm -hmm. I'm just sharing that lonely planet travelers notes and I would love to see your notes I would love to see what you see fair enough I I, I, I have to say I don't think uh, I wanted to be asked that that question directly but um, <laughs> you know what what EFT um, allowed me to become aware of though is that 
I have no idea what I'm believing until I go looking, uh-huh. right? And, you know, Gary calls it, Gary Craig calls it the writing on your walls, oh. which I love. Uh, you know, it, it puts me back in that playful kid place too, to all the graffiti that you saw, mm-hmm. all the different messages that were there that were probably very foreign to you. What do they mean? I don't know. Could be anything. I never heard of that, that word, right? Could be anything. And so that puts me back in wonder, and I like that. But all the time in my work, and I'm going to guess yours too, we're, we're helping them find out what they actually believe about that. And then we're actually helping them find out, is that actually yours? Or was that handed to you? In other words, how'd you learn that? Right? And so we tend to learn three basic ways. Uh, Somebody teaches you, they tell you, often repetitively. Mm. If I've told you once, I've told you a million times, Johnny. Right? (laughs) But we also have uh, some kind of event that teaches us something. Right? Better not do that again. Right, But then the most popular one among the children, and we were all children once as far as I can tell, um, is conclusionary. Right, We're built to make meaning of the world that is our evolutionary design. And the first thing that seems reasonable or doesn't get kicked back is the one we stop at. Just keep that. Right? Just keep that one. Okay, it must be because... And we're not even conscious of we're making that language, but let's just say it's a placeholder language. That must be because. So in a child's world, you know, dad must have left because I was exactly what he said, a pain in the ass. Yeah. I am the cause of dad leaving. Okay. Right. And that word because is very powerful. Because is hugely powerful, right? It speaks to the meaning we've made, but even a loving conscious doing their best super parent cannot change that perception for you that perception that repeated has become a belief because they don't know you're thinking that they don't know you're believing that but when we do hear a child say well it's probably because or i did this and therefore you know they don't talk like that but i'm just giving you the equationary language um that's when an adult, any adult, is able to go, huh, wow, I had no idea that you arrived at that conclusion or thought that thing or believed that or had that idea is where I usually end up, right? I had no idea you had that idea. Can mm-hmm. I talk to you about that? Because I don't think I've ever had that idea. Could we talk about this? Right? And immediately it, they, they realize, yes, that is a unique perspective and it's what I'm holding. Mm-hmm. And so then you separate it out. You separate the internal belief from the person by starting to language it, even though I have this idea that mm. is a step away from this internalized perception. Right. Uh, that's important. And, it is. And when you remind them that it's an idea, you are signaling purposefully to them this idea, this idea, this idea, instead of even though I am a horrible child, you know, mm-hmm. I am an ultimate disappointment, becomes even though I do have this idea, I guess, that I was, I am, whatever. It's an idea. And suddenly we can work on something and see it more clearly because it's not an internalized thing with no name shape form well it does have all of the above but it's so integrated in our biocomputer our experience of reality like uh, einstein said the mind that's creating the problem is not going to be the one that solves it so jung would say well there is this power of dissociation where we can see these parts just like in archetypal work uh, seeing it as another and then in that synaptic space and maybe that's a big part of this whole human experience is seeing ourselves as this through this illusion of separation so we can have this moment to say huh you're a variation on a theme aren't you Mm -hmm. and in that space that dialectics can occur What, what, what does this mean how do we hold this in a way that's generative and good the challenge is that there is such um there is such 
theater and its opposite and and the warring and the fighting and saying well um my way is right i know it is your way is obviously completely asinine and backwards and therefore we shall fight yes <laughs> we shall so, so our culture has has perpetuated uh the the dynamics of conflict and I remember in this in my work in graduate school when I first this model first came to me, I, I had been taking uh, lectures on um, on non uh, confrontational models of, of resolution, and I'm thinking, oh my God, this is this is what it is when everyone is allowed a place around the table, and they're all held in accord, like the ideal model of the UN. Yeah. When everyone um, plays nice and and everyone has an equal place at the table, not the whole table, mm -hmm. or control over it, there's something beautiful happens. Every when everyone in the tribe sits around the fire, uh, something beautiful happens. But line them up, and something seems to go awry. Something seems to be well. Who's first? Who's behind? Who's in? The, who's stuck in the middle? Thus, the sacred idea of the circle. And also the transitional idea of the talking stick, uh -huh. right? In this moment, we have agreed, you will speak and we will listen. Mm. And the stick moves to the next iteration or person of that. Absolutely. I, I think that's all true. And going back to what you said a minute ago, I thought was really important is our ability to dissociate is our ability to step back and look at this creation this creation others have made, this creation I have made with my meaning about what that means and what that means to me and all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Here on this, this plane of play, investigation, uh, experience, whatever, this ability to dissociate, step back from, and look at is our peculiar gift. Yes. It's an important one. Mm -hmm. An unexamined life. Is not uh, not the life for us. <laughs> There's this refining, and I think it it goes to the dynamics of what Christ talked about. Is um, you're here to be as a witness, mm -hmm. and I know in my work that um, in some of the the most powerful in my work is deeply um, based in transformation mm -hmm. uh, on a very pragmatic level, as pragmatic as I can be at my particular state of development. And, and there is this power. I realized that, um, uh, you know, my teacher said, well, uh, when you go in with a client, first thing you say is, I don't know. But then she says, but then be present and listen and receive. Be a witness. And there is in that that recognition that we're not the doctor, that we really are the nurse triaging. Mm -hmm. If we could simply uh, witness the world from the heart, there's an empower, a very powerful thing that the heart can do. It can take it all in and transform it and synthesize it. And because they say in the mystical traditions, the metaphysical, that the heart is the center between the lower self and the higher self, between Panchamama and earth and wisdom and the heavenly energy. They come into resonance here with the soul. And in that place of just present consciousness is the allness, if we tap into that. And then all others said. sort of dissolve into that. So I, I really like that. I, I, I see, you know, with the, the the tapping and the energy work and all of the beautiful, I love how you have the science and there's the art of it. Mm. You've developed this beautiful art of understanding, taking from all these different arenas, from all around, because you can... It does work in every arena. It definitely helps in the watery emotional. It definitely helps in the somatic complaints. I remember go, trying it on myself when I was first learning it, I don't know, 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, more than that maybe. But anyway, I'm, I'm trying it on myself, and I have four distinct pains in my back, three actually, I remember them. And I focused on one, did the tapping, and it went away. It went. I mean, it, I'm lying there, and I was like, uh, I can't, I know what I'm feeling and it's gone, but the other two were still there. I tuned into the second, I got rid of that one, but there was still the one. 
very curious the way consciousness in the nervous system work and energy body works. And then I got rid of the third one. And I thought how amazing it does work on somatic complaints as well. And we also know it works in the air realm of mind and uh, relational dynamics and communication. So I love that about the EFT. The energy psychology really is a holistic uh, venture. It, it can transcend and, or move between these worlds very beautifully. And that's a sign of, I think, a very powerful uh, approach. Well, thank you. And, you know, I, I think I feel so simpatico about you because I observe mm. you doing the same things. And so I'm attracted to, to that because we, we have some operational compatibles, right? Some compatibles, um, yeah. Some compatibles. And I do think that um, often you'll see when I write about uh, these things, I use W in front of it. It is a holistic with a W before the H of it, because I, th I think that's what's important to pass on. It is a complete amalgamation of many powerful ideas packaged in a terribly elegant little elemental format. And the use of it that you can teach your grandchild is just as powerful and relative to them as the deep underpinnings of an iceberg in the hands of someone who has transformation, uh, transformational guide services available to give, right? Mm. It's that, it's, it's again, it's up and down that, that vertical axis, I think, at the, at the highest, highest little tiny level of, of encounter. It's this beautiful little peak of an iceberg out there that a child will go, oh, I can do it and I'm done. And then you can travel all the way down into these depths. This heart of darkness is exactly what we're talking about. And yet we don't get lost and we have a guide and that is our job. And this little tool set is deconstructing that with them, with them. Uh, and it's so important to be there with them and for them. We look at the times we're in. I mean, we are all come into times. We always have these bogeymans, but they certainly have theirs. They're up against a lot. And I, and I dare say those that do come in at this time uh, have to be intrepid souls to know what they're coming into. But to know that we're creating um, a, a space for them, a generative space to help them navigate this and discharge what is not theirs, what they need to be able to quickly let go of, I think is very powerful. My son started a program, or he's starting this year, a brand new program, uh, a couple from Yale that, um, that had this great idea for project-based uh, learning at kindergarten, first grade, he's in first grade. And um, their, their teachers are marvelous, they're very open. They brought in people from all around the world to understand their methods and the way that they held this uh, educational process. All very, I, I mean, I, I'm having so much fun connecting with his, uh, his teacher alone. Uh, she's, a, uh, she's an amazing woman. And um, I would love, I know you're in New York and I'm down here in Connecticut now, and I would love to be able to work uh, bringing you to our, that program, the Slate School, and have you um, teach this tool. I, I, I have taught it to my kids and it's, and it's phenomenal, but we do know well being parents that uh, it's, it's, it's always very powerful when another brings it. I, I like nothing better. I mean, that, as you well know, is, is part of what I'm up to in the world is, is I'm not turning away from veterans work and I'm not turning away from one-on-ones. It's I'm turning in towards to shore up. That's not actually the word it's expand to expand my focus upon the young ones and arm them, equip them, is a better word, equip them with these tools for better knowing your emotional wisdom, for better access to all of you as a way to be more powerfully in the world, more powerfully engaged, more powerfully managing, self-managing, more powerful envisioning. Yeah, that. Is please, this the book you're... Please do find an opening. Yes, I, I'm. I'm going to send this interview to Julie and and make sure that that happens. And I, I know she will love it. Um, and I would definitely make sure that I, I, I'm very excited for that. 
Is this uh, the subject of your book that you're writing? Um, thank you for asking about it. I, I thought I was writing a book called The Heart of EFT, and the more I wrote in it and the more it refused to be finished, the more I contemplated, why is that? You know, it, do I have too much to say about it or am I being redundant about it? And then I realized, oh, it's because it's not about EFT. And so <laughs> later I went, well, is it about the heart of healing? And I said, you know, I think it might be, but it sounds presumptive. And so what could you say about that that is more true, which is a, a favorite question of mine. And I Good went, question. This is about how we heal. And I went, oh, okay. So now, uh, you know, part of this last year has been going back through and just taking out some of the mini EP or EFT references and realizing this is just about the decision to help ourselves and others heal. Wow. Right? What do we need to take with us for that journey? And so what I've come up with is a rather, a rather meandering and sometimes humorous prologue. Then I've got about 22 sections. I, uh, they're not chapters, but they're about 22 sections of different emotional concepts and cognitive concepts that I think we would likely pack with us and take mm with us wow. for this work that we do and so that's what I'm writing it's it's this is how we heal and wow. so we'll see maybe a better title still will come to me but I think that I is what imagine. I can truly say right now well that's a beautiful title how we heal um, it's very it's a very powerful yeah. powerful well I hope it's open enough so that everybody feels like it's not the way we heal it is oh these are the things these, these are the kinds of things that factor into how we do that because isn't it beautiful when somebody gives you a piece of advice and go well that's easy for you to say <laughs> uh how do i go about that well yeah that's conceptual aspects are really important but also the the realistic part like how how, are, how do you, what resources, what tools are you using? How do you apply them? Um, these are all, they may seem pedantic or they may seem uh, overly technical or mechanical, um, but they are the underpinnings of a good art. To be a, a, a phenomenal uh, pianist, one must learn chopsticks and one must learn the practice. And I, I think it's no different in our work. Um, I think there's been this sort of um, specious notion about this work that, um, if you're just a natural, just get out there and do it. And I think there's value to that. But um, we also recognize that there's a discipline and a devotion. And that what quite often looks as a simple um, presence is a very studied and a very uh, practiced and disciplined being who's going through the process. And, and going through that, you can let it all go. Like Jung said, learn all the mythology you can learn. Because in that are these inherent structures of the way the human mind thinks the way we engage each other and this is documentation this is the mechanics that of the moment of, of how we engage each other and, and live our lives but when you're in session let all that go it'll serve you absolutely uh, I, I love the way that you express that and you know just on hilarious little everyday versions of my training to people I, I ask especially those who are so well practiced hmm. and their modality I mean, they, they paid a lot of money, dues, and time for facility in that modality. And all I ask them to do is sort of imagine a hinge on their prefrontal and just go, eh. It's there. It's available. It's accessible. It didn't go anywhere. I but we it. opened to a middle mind place where different kinds of information are waiting for you. And that's important to be going into the experiential learning. Uh, as my teacher says, she said, well, look, when you're in this imaginal work, when you're going into the other realms, leave your analytical mind uh, at the door. Yes. But don't forget to take it home with you when you leave. <laughs> but there is a sense that when you're in, when you're in a game, mm -hmm. when you're in a performance of any sort, uh, one must let go of all that 
um, you know, should I put my foot here? But you got to dive into the field of it. But then before and after, that is a place of analysis and that it's appropriate then to, you know, go through the review the game. And, but when you're in it, right. that's a place to just let go. Absolutely. That that perceptual place that we're doing has all those things off to the side as conscious choice, deliberate mm. choice, and the ability to hold that field, I think, is very practiced. Uh, I don't mean fay or slick. I mean, I deliberately worked at that yeah. for a very good reason that then I can share with somebody else. Um, so I, I believe you're absolutely right about that. And so this deliberate coming to, uh, I think ACM calls it uh, the holy instant, right? Um, mm -hmm. A Course in Miracles, I think, calls miracles and, and this, this sp spontaneous kind of healing space. They call it the holy instant. But I think of this moment that we are with whoever we've agreed to be with as a version of that. You know, that instant is, it is a moment in time however long it is that is being encapsulated but purposefully consciously right now this thing that i'm holding this space with you is very purposeful and it is just about simply being and i i've developed more uh faith and certitude that all those tools that I need or they're just right there if I need those but nothing is going to replace the idea that this thing that we're creating in safety and consciousness for that person there's nothing more important to them than that and I don't actually care what modality that you come at it with hmm. if you have this it, it's going to be a healing of you know I, I don't know as they say, what else is going to happen. But that's part of the Shoshen. That's part of the Zen beginner's mind of just clean. clean. The center, center of it all. The Without that, all. there is all the rest is just other things. It's just stuff. Hmm. Right? Yeah. Right. Well, we're talking about Kairos time and, and time out of time, and there's Kronos time, time within time. And, and Kairos can lead us in places where we say, oh my God, was that really two hours? Yeah. You know, Krona says, in fact, it was. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Well, in terms of Kronos, I know I realize you do uh, have an appointment to make. So I appreciate you taking this time with me. Um, I'm honored and I'm grateful for your sharing and to, to model so much wisdom, uh, hard-earned and, and well-earned, well-deserved wisdom that you've gained over the years to, to, to share with me and with everyone else. Uh, because I think this is where uh, the big changes come is if we can be more open source about what we have and what we can share. I, I certainly default in that direction um, because I'm so excited and proud of what I've learned and, and excited and proud for those who taught it to me. And I honor that. I honor what I learned from you and, and all others. And it's a wonderful thing that uh, you're willing to hold that space to to share some of this learning with all of us now. Well, thank you. I, I think this is the great integration. And, and that can't happen without visionaries like you saying, I have created this structure that is at once real and open hmm. and of possibility, expansion and contraction. Hmm. But this is where we meet and this is where we pull in, just like you were talking before. This is where we're pulling in those uh, things that will become the seeds of possibility, that will become larger than anything that, that you heard or learned out there because it's being integrated into something purposeful and much larger. And we know not yet what. Isn't that beautiful? The mystery's real. It's true. Well, thank you I so thank much, you. Kelly. A great, a great pleasure always to be with you. <laughs> well, this is going to be a, a pleasure to um, to edit because I can't imagine taking anything out, but the, maybe the dog barking. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> thank well. you, John D. It's a pleasure, uh, everyone. Uh, we 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 posted the first um, edit, and and I, you know, my editing skills are are challenge so but but some really great points were uh john D put across and and some really great insights i really enjoyed uh talking with her so if you look on her site you'll see that 
Um, she has tappingstar.com uh, as uh, her website. Um, that you is this the one you just completed? No, it's not. It's actually the original site, and oh, okay. so for purposes of resources, which is what we you know want to give with these talks mm -hmm. for purposes of resources we still have some downloadables on tappingstar.com which was created not for children but for people who want to work with children ah, oh good and i'm doing a, a large workshop up in um rhode island in mm -hmm. september eight and nine about creative tapping techniques for working well with children this is my expansion and moving towards a larger site that we're working on called tapping for kids international and it will have large persons tall persons as well as sections for short persons and and in that way we hope that that's an expansionary way to look at holistically working with children with lots of different iterations but creativity would be right there at the forefront the right? middle of fire i love it there you well go. john D, i i'm as soon as we get off i'm texting uh my son's teacher i cannot wait to have you um i know you're you're beginning to do more uh, seminars and workshops. So uh, if you have an interest in what uh, John Dee's doing, please contact her. Um, I'm sure at the very least, she'll have very good insights. But <clears throat> thank you so much for this wonderful interview. And uh, I hope we talk soon. Uh, this will be up before I leave for Santa Cruz uh, on Monday. So I'll have it all ready and it'll be up early next uh, Monday. Great. Promise me that, that we'll have a great visit when you come back and I'll hear all about it. Absolutely. Thank you and have an incredible weekend. You too. Fly well. Bye-bye.